Check, 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 check. You're a nice boy. You know who's not a nice boy? Me. Because I'm going to give you the five reasons you shouldn't back Monster Hunter Iceborne. It's happened. Monster Hunter Iceborne has hit $1 million on Kickstarter. Well, almost a $1 million US. As you can see, it's over a $1 million Canadian. And I think Artie might be upset that I'm projecting, but that's okay. Uh, if you're new to the channel, welcome. This is the five reasons you shouldn't back Monster Hunter Iceborne. I mean, the reason number one you should back it is so that you have a, a big old box for Artie to sit in. But if you're new to the channel, this is a series that I do every time a Kickstarter or board game campaign crosses over a million dollars on crowdfunding to try to provide the devil's advocate. Because I feel like whenever those sorts of games come across, they have a certain level of FOMO or fear of missing out. And I think the important thing with games is to make sure that you're equally excited as you are right now when you're clicking the back button when it also arrives at your door and you don't just click it and forget about it and then regret it down the line after you've spent sometimes hundreds of dollars as an all-in pledge will absolutely run you. And so that's what this series is about. I'm not picking on the little guy. In fact, I like the little guy. And in fact, I do like Monster Hunter. I, I have a review of Monster Hunter on this channel. I have an unboxing, a review. And so I feel like I come at this from a stance of fairly decent knowledge, considering I've read through the Iceborne rulebook and have played Monster Hunter numerous times. If you're interested in the full review of Monster Hunter, go check it out. But first, before we get into the five reasons you shouldn't back, let's talk about what I am personally excited about. And honestly, I'm excited that there's more Monster Hunter that did well enough that they want to do a sequel. <laughs> yeah, you're cuddly. Because Monster Hunter was a pretty good game. I gave it a seal of approval on the channel, four out of five-ish. I thought it was really fun. I, I Some of the great moments in Monster Hunter, I think, will be in Monster Hunter World Iceborne as well. That sort of ballet of minis. Now you get two minis in this one. That one feels exciting. And even if you were a previous backer of Monster Hunter World, well, don't worry, you can figure out a way to make that cross-compatible so that you can use your Monster Hunter World and have, like, a skirmish minis with the two monsters who want to fight you and each other. But yeah, I know this is another game with a combat system that I already enjoy. Uh, I love how you jump around the monsters. I enjoy the differences in the characters. I really like the crafting in the characters, and this gives you more crafting. Like, my review was ultimately pretty positive. I won't show the people pictures. I won't. I'll keep petting you. I'm sorry. You can blame Artie. And I'm definitely more interested in Iceborne now that I have played Monster Hunter World than I was for Monster Hunter World when it first came out, like, three years ago-ish? It was on Kickstarter, I want to say? Two years ago. I think it was two years ago. Two years ago, kind of March-ish. Say bye to the people. Well, now I can show you th some things. <laughs> the Kickstarter page. You've never seen that before. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of things to be excited about. I'm also really excited about the art direction in this. I think I personally like the art cold frost theme. Like that box looks so crisp and clean compared to this foresty situation. And also, as far as Kickstarters go, I mean, we'll have to wait and see when Monster Hunter actually drops in retail. I think that's happening in Q4. But I think this might be an okay price. Like, the, the discount here feels like it incorporates the shipping, and you still might get it for a, a little cheaper. And I like that. I like when they actually give you a reason to purchase these things. Oh, that's cool. On the knee? That's neat. Yeah, you get new monsters, you get new dynamic settings, I guess. And all in all, Monster Hunter is a fun game. It may not be a fun game for some of you. I think all board games are not for all people. <laughs> I wish they were. I desperately wish they were, and then maybe my family gatherings wouldn't be so tedious all the time, combined with my parole officer meetings and my disciplinary hearings, and also those multiple weddings that I'm going to have to attend this summer. I'm just kidding. I'm skipping them to film YouTube content. But there are legitimate reasons why somebody shouldn't back and why this game may not be right for you, and I'm about to go into those right now. I just don't want to repeat myself because I just put out the review. 
So if you want like more positives and more in depth of Monster Hunter World, feel free to check into that one. And let's just get right into the reasons for Iceborne. And reason number five is that you just have big box campaign fatigue. And this one is shout out to Vault Boy in the Discord because he wrote that when we were talking about it, it's like, hey, everyone was excited. It had just launched. And he was like, listen, I don't know how you all keep getting excited about all these gigantic boxes. Because we talk about it in the Discord, right? It's a, it's a place where uh, all of us can congregate and talk about the things that excite us. And we know the things that excite us in common are board games. Some board games excite us more than others. And those board games generally have been created by a, an elusive man named Fabio. But most board games t tend to excite us as well. <laughs> But he put that comment and I was like, you know what? That's my number five. That is my number five reason because I'm absolutely feeling it as well. There are so many campaigns. The campaigns that tend to cross this million dollar bar tend to be huge. They're just, they're just huge. I mean, if we look at this core box pledge, okay, we know that's going to be a gigantic box. We look at the hunter's pledge, even down here, we know it's going to be three gigantic boxes and they haven't put anything else other than a Hunter's Pledge, which is surprising to me, and I think is probably going to change throughout the campaign into getting more and more stuff. But even just at that three giant box level, like, it, it, it says something about our hobby or, or about the Kickstarter crowdfunding fervor that we find ourselves in so much that three giant boxes starts to feel reasonable. If that's starting to feel reasonable, that's a whole other conversation in general. But I think you need to be mindful about that big box campaign fatigue, especially if you have big boxes on the way that haven't yet delivered. There's a tendency in Kickstarter, and I know I've been through it, I know many people who have also been through it, to purchase first and ask questions later, and then you just get inundated with packages. And sure, hey, Christmas came forever because you're always getting things arriving at your door. And so even though you may not have big box fatigue yet, think about the amount of stuff that's coming to your door. And I guarantee you, if you were a serial Kickstarter purchaser like I am slash was, welcome to Buyers Anonymous. <laughs> I see you in the comments then really just take a minute and take a step back because the worst thing, just the worst thing that's ever happened to anyone ever, I'm fairly certain ever, is for the amount of things that you have arriving to diminish your excitement for all of them because that's absolutely happened to me. I feel I've gotten a bunch of stuff. I have felt overwhelmed. I still have campaigns from my buying spree that I went on in 2020, in 2020 that are on their way to me. Let's see, how many how many campaigns do I have outstanding right now? I have Kingdom Rush, the big elemental horde coming my way. I have Fract Fractal of the Void, or Fractures of the Void, or whatever that one was. I just know it was almost the same as Voidfall. I've got that coming my way. I have Dragon Bond Lords of Valor coming my way. I have Iridia coming my way. I have the second wave of Trudvon coming my way. These are all purchases and like things that I have purchased in the past, and since then I've acquired more and more and more, that I was really thrilled for. I mean, I'm still really thrilled and going to be excited for Iridia. That's holding my excitement. But for a lot of things, that excitement dwindles, right? And, and I think there hits a point where you can only have so many big boxes. And so not adding another one to that list is sometimes a very good thing, even if you might be or think you might be excited for it. Just like Artie's excited to wake up on camera. What's number four? Uh, reason number four is if you don't like Death by a Thousand Cats. Cuts! Death by a Thousand Cuts. And so this is a gameplay point. There are some games that you play where you really build up your stats, you build up your tactics, you have this one incredible turn, you've built up your spells, you unleash all of your spells all at once, you deal 20 damage to the big bad, you've been building to that epic conclusion the entire time. This is not one of those games. It isn't. If that's what you like in your games, this isn't that. This is a game like I said, of death by a thousand cuts. Oftentimes on your turn, you'll be dealing one damage to this monster. If they have armor, <laughs> every turn you'll be dealing one damage to this monster. There are monsters out there that have like three or four armor 
and you're, you're just pinging them one at a time, one at a time. And so that's what captures what I really enjoyed about this game is this sort of ballet of movement that I talk about in my review. This idea, and let's see if we can get a, a photo up, or even better, a GIF. This is the best one that they have, showing that they're throwing on little breakpoints, trying to break elements of the monster. But there is this dance. There's this whole dance where... I'll just go to the rule book, right? Over here, these behavior cards will pop up, and it'll tell you if the monster moves, how much damage it does, what the range of that is, what the dodge value of that is, and then how many people get to act, right? Like those, are the, those are the sort of core mechanics of the game. But it results in you just chipping away and having to dodge. Dodging and maintaining your stamina are equally as important and are the things that you're going to be doing an equal amount of time in your gameplay loop as you will sort of fighting the monster. An epic turn is dealing like five damage when you get into the later monsters, right? You start out small, but then you get into the later ones and they all have so much armor and they're just, ah, oh, they're just the worst. <laughs> but that makes it fun. That makes it uh, difficult and that makes it interesting. However, you need to be in the mood for that sort of style of game. This isn't like a zombicide where you get to chuck dice, mow things down. It's all card driven combat. And oftentimes you'll find your entire stamina row filled up and you can only play one card or you have to run away and like take a breath and sharpen your weapon and things that help it feel thematic, which I think Steamforge has always been known for, really emphasizing their tie in with the theme and with the IP. But it's really about chipping away. And like I found my experience never gave me those supreme highs of a turn it's kind of more wrapped up in the the overarching battle now reason number three i think is a really important one and that is if you are not planning to play the campaign this was one of my biggest issues with monster hunter and i don't imagine honestly that it's fixed it in iceborne the campaign I really enjoyed playing and I think is the only way to play the game. They have this one-shot mode and I'm really happy that this one-shot mode exists. However, it takes out the entire point of having a little narrative text at the beginning. And so I guess like if you're playing, you can just skip the narrative text. Because for me, when I played the biggest boss, I wanted to jump ahead and do a one-shot of the biggest baddest monster that they ever created and so we played it and we got this one shot loadout and so we got all of these different pieces of armor on ourselves and then we spent the first 10-15 minutes reading through this story passage that was like hey search and get resources but since it's a one shot none of that matters because you're not going to use those resources to craft anything else because you can't really because it's a one shot and that would be weird. And so we just like read through this story and it felt very pointless, really did. Whereas when I was doing it through the campaign mode, I was very excited about the story element. I didn't think it overstayed its welcome that, that much at all. It was kind of like 10, 15 minutes and I felt that was like the perfect time of this choose your own adventure style thing. I was like, oh, that's fun. Yeah, we want to get these crafting items because we want to craft better things because we want to move along in the campaign. That's all the campaign really does is focuses around that sort of crafting system. And the crafting system is basically just beat parts off of big monsters, use those parts to make that monster's style of weapon or armor. That's it. But it's actually meaningful if you have plans to progress through the campaign and kind of like level up your characters leveling them up through the leveling up of their gear and their defenses so that they can take more than one hit and not die immediately. Again, that sort of razors, knife, dodging, etc. things that you're going to have to do. And so personally, I found the one-shot campaign aspect very lackluster. I mean, you still get to do the battle. That's fine. But I just really missed those elements of the campaign aspect. And I also thought the loadouts or how they were designed, or at least the one scenario that I played in the biggest, baddest monster were, were dumb. I thought they were. They, <laughs> they gave you a bunch of armor and a bunch of weapons that had elemental effects on them, different elemental resistances that did not apply to the current situation. If a monster never does water damage, why would you give two of the four people like resistances to water? It just felt a little silly. And, and perhaps it's there because you don't want people to be tanked up, 
right? You want those one shots to feel a little bit more difficult and you want them to not have any resistance or not have any damage and you just needed a random piece of armor that had the defense stat needed to face this monster. I get that. It just felt a little silly when I was like, okay, cool. My character now has this this water ability. And what's that? Oh, he's impervious to water, so these cards are just garbage? Great. That's fun. Like, it just, it just wasn't as fun as it could be and wasn't as fun as that kind of progressing through the campaign aspect I found was. So that's why I think if you're not going to go through that campaign and it's a campaign you can drop in and out of really but if you're not planning on doing that and you're like hey it's got a one-shot mode great i i don't think it meets its full potential through that one-shot mode i think it meets its full potential through the campaign mode and that's why that's my reason number three now reason number two is very simple uh reason number two is monster hunter world will be in retail sooner than you will get this version of your game that's it and monster hunter world will be just as good. Now, I know that they've been talking about a lot of the different changes in between these two things, and I was excited when they were talking about it as well. I was excited that they, they mentioned, listen, our, our methodology going forward is that this is not an expansion. It's not a standalone expansion either. It's its own game. And honestly, I think that is an awesome approach to take. I think that's the right approach to take because I don't think you need to mix and match your Monster Hunter stuff, I think these these can exist as their own separate entities. But from what I have seen, personally, I don't think that there are enough differences between Monster Hunter Iceborne and Monster Hunter World to really warrant needing to wait for it, right? Now, that being said, this is kind of the second iteration. There are some really cool quality of life things that I picked up on when going through the rule book. You can see, oh, that's not a good example. Where, where's, the, where's the example I wanted? Here's the example I wanted. Uh, you can see over here that down below there are some little symbols. These symbols here are your range symbols, your break symbols, how many break tokens get added, and these combo symbols, meaning how many cards you need to have played before that card in order to activate it. So some of the really strong cards need you to have built up for them to do that epic smash, right? And then you still, you know, you do two damage because they have a bajillion pieces of armor on them. <laughs> but I love that these are all zeros here because in the previous Monster Hunter world, the cards that had it as just all zeros, they didn't have them as the symbols. So I think that's, that's like a really awesome marking of... Uh, a quality of life change that I'm sure we're going to see like a few more quality of life changes in this. And just having that there helps the player absorb that information for the first time better. Uh, I know when we were playing, we kind of forgot what the symbols were. We're like, oh, we, we missed the symbols because they weren't on every card. And so like putting them as zeros and just across the board, I think is zeros across the board. Uh, I think is a tens across the board moment. And I'm really happy that that's happening. Some other differences is that you now have health or stamina potions <laughs> instead of just a regular potion that kind of does both things. So that's pretty big. But wait, there's more. Uh, there's more differences. Let's look here at the monster target phase. See, the monster's target is the, is the hunter who currently has the monster's attention. The target is used to determine which way the monster will move and attack. And over here, the monster's target is the hunter who currently has the monster's attention. The target is then used to determine the way monsters will move and attack. Oh, oh, it's not, it's not different. Well, okay, if the behavior is the closest target symbol, the monster's target will be the hunter closest to it. And then over here, you know, if the behavior has the closest target symbol, the monster's target will be the hunter closest to it. Determined by counting the nodes between the monster, determined by counting... You see the point that I'm making here. Same. It's the same game. Uh, <laughs> and because it is the same game, you might as well get it sooner. Like, there's, there's this extra terrain. In the original, you just had bush, rock, and pond, but now we got the deep snow. So the agility of your attack cards is reduced to one, to a minimum of one, and that's awful. Makes it harder to hit and or dodge. But what's the main point that I really wanted to point out? Oh yeah, you see, each hunter's starting cards in Iceborne, you are going to miss out on picking up one weapon card, three armor cards, and 21 attack cards. And in Monster Hunter World, well, it's basically a baby game, right? Because you only get one weapon card, three armor cards, and 20 attack cards in your starting deck. The differences here are incredible. <laughs> they're they're mind-blowing to me. <laughs> no, obviously it's based on the same core system, right? But that's my point, is that it is based on the same core system. 
and you don't necessarily get to need to get this newest shiniest thing when the thing that is good will be in retail sooner you can get at the table sooner you can capitalize on your excitement sooner if this is something where you're like yeah i really want to play this game by not getting this game you will get to play this game sooner because you'll you can get it at retail it's, it's projected to be q4 that's what they said so around christmas time instead of you know, it took two years to deliver last time. It'll probably be quicker this time, honestly, because they have all the things set. But, like, you have that opportunity, right? Oh, another difference that I thought was cool. I meant to put this in my excitement aspect, but I didn't. Oh, no, that's the wrong rule book. So they somehow look the same. Is these mantles. These are new. You don't start the game with any mantles, but you can collect them during the campaign. And they basically, it looks like they just act as one-time abilities, right? So the fact that you can kind of customize yourself as you're going and you can collect these mantles... One lets you break off and get loot more easily. That's what this text is that I zoomed in on so I could read it. Yeah, roll two dice in the monster's reward table and gain those resources, which is huge, again, inconsequential if you're not playing the campaign. And then once per quest, when this hunter is attacked, reduce that damage suffered by three. Also huge because most attacks just kill you outright. So being able to reduce it, th that feels pretty good. So, so that's something that's a bit exciting. But like, you don't, you don't need it. Like, you don't need to purchase this one just for that upgrade. And honestly, that kind of goes into my number one point, which they're kind of the same. So I'll give you a, a, an extra point at the end. That was for the people who don't currently own Monster Hunter. If you do currently own Monster Hunter, this number one point is for you. You own enough Monster Hunter World already. You do. And you have to think about if you're going to really play it or not, or enough to warrant getting more. And if you just have the base game of Monster Hunter, that's all I have, the Ancient Forest, that is all I would ever want. There are other expansions you can add to it to fight new monsters and different things that act as this sort of thing, right? And you can add them when you feel like you want to add more content after you've played through your existing game. And this is my number one point because of the timing of the thing. A lot of Kickstarters, a lot of companies do this. It just makes sense in terms of marketing. You will release your campaign when your other one is delivering, especially if it's a sequel. Say, hey, you're excited about getting this thing. You're very excited. You got all those boxes. You got the all-in. The all-in is just so, so many boxes. It takes up so much room. But you're excited about it. You've unboxed it all. You've seen all the cool figures, and they're really cool. Now it's time for you to get more because you are excited, not because you are playing the game enough to warrant more. And I think that's the distinction and that's the sort of prompt that I want to make as the number one. I know there are some of you out there, I know people have mentioned it in the Discord, and yes, I'm personally attacking you, that <laughs> you're going all in on this one having not even yet played the one that's arrived at your door. And that's ludicrous. You don't know how much you're going to get this game to the table. The base box boasts a 25-day campaign. It's the same for Iceborne. It's the same for Ancient Forest. That's 25 potential sessions. Now, they recommend 20 actual sort of game sessions and then five day sessions where you can go off to another market, you can go into town, you can get some upgrades at the expense of one of those days. And the goal of the campaign is to kill like a four-star monster. That's the whole premise of the campaign. It's so like easy breezy light, but just provides a wonderful structure. That means you're getting 20 plays out of this. The base box. Now, if you have the first Monster Hunter, you also got Wild Spire Waste, which is another base box. That's another 20, 20 games. And then there's a bunch of other little monsters who require, you know, adding on 5 to 10 days of campaign for each one of them. There's so much content out there already. And for those of you who have it, I think you should play it. I think you should see how much you enjoy it before just purchasing it based solely upon the IP. Or that leads us to number zero, because this is a point that I remembered and I didn't write down. I was like, okay, well, I guess we're doing number zeros now because we did it for Aeon Stress Fest Odyssey. Number zero is if you're not a painter. Uh, I personally thought the minis of Monster Hunter were really cool, but I don't paint my minis, right? Like the minis represent a significant cost factor because they're gigantic. They are. They one of their selling points oh yeah you're getting the same you're getting the same core characters as well 
the dual blades, the bow. I was playing as the bow in Ancient Forest. Great sword. Like these are the same characters because they're the same characters from the IP. It's the same characters that you're getting again. Are the decks going to play fairly similarly? Probably. But like you see the the size of these things, 100 millimeter base size. These things are gigantic. These things are really cool. Well, that guy's just a friggin' freak. But here we go. How big are the monsters? 93 millimeters. Like that's like 147 millimeters, 81 millimeters, 100 millimeters. Like these are big, beefy monsters. And I feel like one of the main reasons should be that you are a painter and that you would get a lot of enjoyment playing the game, but also painting the game. And if that's you, then then go for it. But if it's not you and you don't have inclinations to paint, like myself, who's an awful painter, then you better have a neighbor who wants to paint them because it's just a shame for these glorious friggin' minis to remain unpainted. Somebody in the comments of the unboxing or the review said that they weren't happy with the minis. I mean, you're going to get people saying that all the time. For me, I thought they were really cool. You can check them out in the unboxing. Anyway, that's number zero uh, painting. I think that's it. I think we'll leave this off. It's a bit more rambly. I think I already threw off my train of thought and I wanted to cram stuff in. But yeah, those are the five reasons why you shouldn't back Monster Hunter Iceborne. For me personally, I'll tell you, Steamforge, because they sent me a copy of Monster Hunter Ancient Forest. And because I have a copy of Monster Hunter Ancient Forest, I, I, don't, I don't need to back this one. They might be sending me a copy of Iceborne for review and I'd be happy to check it out, see the differences, uh, see what's the deal with the turf wars. I think that does look really cool and interesting. I think it's it, it would be fun to it's it's why it's the reason I like playing the necromancer, right? You just walk, you step away, and you let the the monsters do your bidding. <laughs> I think that's the a uh, potentially fun aspect of this new edition. So they might send it to me, providing I haven't offended them greatly with this video. And if I have, well, you know that's why I do it. I do it to offend people. No, I do it to because I value you all as an audience and I try to be the devil's advocate. And I also think it's cool that generally Steamforge doesn't mind that and has uh, wanted to work with me, even though <laughs> they're always going to break a million bucks and I'm always going to have to put out one of these videos on them. But I like them. So <laughs> there you go. But yeah, for me, like we, we were having a conversation about like, hey, um, when Iceborne comes around, you know, like, maybe I can put you on the list for more than just the base box game. And I said, honestly, I don't I don't have the space. I don't have the space for more than just a base box game. I don't. I think you get a great value in that base box because you're going to get a, a, a bunch of plays out of it. Wait a minute. Am I hyping it too much? No, uh, no. But this is, this is my actual thoughts. I, I, I think in that base model, like that base box, that's all you need. It really is. Even though the stretch goals are going to be tempting you and they're not giving you stretch goals if you just get the base box. Again, a reason to wait for retail. Like, don't let the stretch goals tempt you into spending more than you need to on this game. I think the base box is completely fine. And it's annoying to me that you don't get the stretch goals unless you go to that extra, extra tier. I always dislike when companies do that. I understand you're paying for the stretch goals, and you have to pay that money <laughs> and you have to pay more money in order to fund the stretch goals and the creation of them. And you're just getting like the discount on the base pledge. I get it, but it never feels good as somebody who usually only goes in at that base level and tries not to get those expansions and that stuff before I've played the game. I don't really like when that happens. And that's kind of that's kind of crappy that 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 is there. And, and that's what pulls me in as the FOMO, right? I think, oh, I'm going to get extra monsters. Oh, they're going to have different forms and abilities. Oh, I'm going to get little uh, little minis for my, my poogles, my little palicos that you only use in a one to two player game and you don't even put them really on the board because they don't really have any importance. <laughs> I still feel that pull, but I just don't think you need it. I think if you already have Monster Hunter, you probably have enough content to keep you happy for a long time, or at least happy enough until this comes out in retail. And then, yeah, go get it. I don't want you not to get it. I just want you to consider really how you're going to use it. Anyway, that's it for me. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. If you're backing or if you're not, drop your comments down below. I love with these videos, everybody chimes in and shares their reasons why they should or they shouldn't back. Uh, I find it a really good discussion point because it's great having more voices and opinions. And that often helps people who are undecided as well. So thanks for 
Thanks for commenting down below. Thanks for liking and subscribing. My name is Chris George. I do not have a catchphrase. Somebody in the comments will say something funny. Just pretend I said that. <laughs>